Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, and welcome to our parent um, for this week. Um, this week, we've got um, uh, currently one member of our counseling department. Um, another one is going to join us in a little bit. She had a um, her own um, school meeting for her um, her own kids this morning, so she's going to join us in a little bit. Um, but Natalie, I'm going to let you go ahead and introduce yourself. Um, and you know, if you want to give a little um, kind of like what the gist of the presentation was um, on Tuesday night, and like what like we're hoping that you know the parents of ninth and tenth graders took away from that. Sure. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. My name is Miss uh, Rodriguez Garcia. And um, I'm the counselor for students, last name Nguyen, first names um, N to Z, and then so Nguyen all the way to S-O. So this is the most confusing part of the breakdown of the alpha. Um, but yeah, the presentation for the parent night um, was just a general overview of um, general contacts to know in the school. And... Um, and then we talked a little bit briefly about colleges and mainly about the different systems and what's ex, um, uh, expected yeah, for that, um, applications. Sure fine, you know. um, and you know. what else did we cover? Um, upcoming events and what they should be focusing on for this year. I've never gotten a bad. Great. Um, and then also we have our APED, Nancy Pereira with us today. Um, Nancy, do you want to reintroduce yourself and say anything um, from your perspective about the ninth and 10th grade high school years? Oh, okay. Good morning. I'm Nancy Pereira. I'm the associate principal. Uh, I oversee the curriculum side of things. So testing, scheduling, um, all the fun stuff. And um, so just for the ninth and 10th grade, I think it's, I think just to kind of remind students, sometimes they get mixed messaging that ninth grade doesn't really count. And well, it kind of does. So just kind of remind them that those things do count. And, um, you know, they, it's a transition year for sure for middle school, but um, I think they just kind of, some of them, some of them think they should already be, you know, going to college next week. So that's the other side of things. But anyway, just, you know, it doesn't matter to always do their best and put their best foot forward. Yeah, I'll um, back that up. You know, I think that, um, especially for parents that are first time um, high school parents, um, you know, if you haven't had an older child go through this before, then it can be really intimidating. I know when my daughter, my daughter is a senior now, but when she first started high school and I've only worked in high schools, like I, you know, started teaching, like my entire career has been in a high school setting and it was still intimidating for me as a parent to come in and like, how does this all work? And, um, because it is, you know, it's the end of their K through 12, um, education, you know, from like after these four years, they either go on to college or they go on to, you know, straight into working or they join the military, you know, this is kind of like the last, um, where we as parents, you know, are really like kind of like in the driver's seat about what's happening. Um, and, but it's also a transition where as parents, we start to, um, let go a little bit of that control and like have them have more of a voice. Um, I think that that's one thing, you know, when we talk about the role of the counselors and what we do at the high school level with, um, in terms of picking classes and scheduling and like, you know, the student's high school career, we really put an emphasis on the student being in the driver's seat I know a lot of times we get questions from parents, well, like, how, why wasn't I, like, more involved in that? Um, because we really want the students to drive what's happening, um, you know, and really take that independence and um, that self-advocacy for themselves. Um, that said, especially in that ninth and tenth grade years, it... Um, you know, they still need a lot of support from, you know, the school and the parents and just, you know, having their... Um, their little team, you could say, around them and guiding them in the right direction. Um, we've had one question in the chat. I'm going to stop sharing my screen in just a second, um, but if 
this was a kind of an opening question to get us started. And then if any of you have questions as we're going, you can either use your raise the hand feature or just put a question in the chat, whatever you feel most comfortable with. Um, but one question we have so far is my biggest concern now is to help them adapt to on site learning once school starts um, and how to teach them how to manage their schedule um, as a high school student. And I think actually I really like this question because I think the time management piece when a student, especially a ninth grade student in tra that transition from middle school into high school. And that to me, when my daughter started high school, that actually was the biggest surprise to me um, on how much handholding still happens in the middle school. And that when we, when they get into high school, as high school educators, we kind of really like, okay, kids, like you've got this now. And like, you know how to like manage your time and how to keep track of your assignments. And, um, you know, one thing my daughter had said to me, you know, when um, she was in middle school, because, you know, she had a very high tech middle school where they, you know, all used iPads and like, but they were all at Edmodo. And like, she's like, I didn't have to keep track of the assignments because I always knew I could like ask my like, classmates would go to the teacher and they would tell me and so I she's like when I went to high school because there wasn't all that she's like I had to remember to write my assignments down and so I think one you know really great thing um, I keep putting in my emails that you come pick up a student planner we provide student planners to all the students they're totally free we've got a ton of them I know hopefully a lot of kids have come and picked them up but if you guys have not taken advantage of that and come and picked up the student planner um, i please come by. We've got them in the main office and we've got them in the book room. Um, but just teaching your kid and getting them in the habit of using that to manage their time and write down their assignments and really like, and actually using the planner to like, what its intention is to plan out when are they going to do this assignment? You know, how are they going to manage their hours in um, the day? Um, so I don't know, Natalie and Nancy, if you've got something to add to that about time management um, in that piece. Um, yeah, I th oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, Natalie. I, th I think the most important thing is, is structure. So if they're structuring in right now, time management, you know, I, I also have a son who's distance learning right now and it was really hard. He's in the second grade, but I think it goes for all levels everyone's trying to adjust. And then how do we have them adjust back? I think it's just the structure and the habits that they have. So getting them into that habit of, <clears throat> excuse me, time management right now, and then just kind of converting it to when they go back to school um, so that they're already used to, you know, writing in their agendas, looking ahead of time, um, making time for study, making time for homework, making time to balance that out and just, um, you know, relax and do something enjoyment um, that they'd like to do. I like to take my son for a walk around the block when he gets frustrated with school. Um, so just keeping that, that structure and including that time management. So if they know time management now, it should be easy to transition when they come back to school. Yeah, I would tag on to that about the structure of the day, you know, as much as you can, like, have like the school day is the school day so there's times in school like that that should be time that they're focused in school and like when would be the normal homework time like you know we were in like regular in-person school like what time of day would the students be working on their homework we you know always recommend like giving them a little bit of a break after school and maybe doing it la late afternoon evening we never recommend that kids are up until like one in the morning doing their homework teenagers will be teenagers they tend to do that but having that structure and like when are you working on your homework and like that sort of thing even now when we're at home is really important but also keep in mind that in a typical school day because kids move around um, from class to class when we're in in-person school they do have movement in their day so if a kid's just like if your kid is at home right now with distance learning you find that they're like just sitting at this table all day in front of the computer that's actually not mimicking a normal school day and so having them get up every like you know during that break time in between classes and get up and move around um even if they're just like walking laps around the house you know or something and like standing up and stretching and having like that brain break and getting some movement is really important nancy i don't know if you had anything to add to that 
Yeah, I agree with all of those um, parts. And something that I've been thinking about um, just for our, the students here and my own child has been um, like, how do, do they know? So there's the academic piece, which obviously that's our primary focus as a school, as well as their emotional well-being. And so I just kind of want, I'm wondering how students are engaging with each other outside of the classroom, given that we have distance learning. So I've been kind of trying to like think of ways to share with families that are appropriate, you know, like do, do are they doing social times social hour with their friends? Are they doing movie watching on weekends? Are they grabbing a boba tea and just hanging out through the computer? Um, you know, depending on your family's idea, are you okay with them going for a social distance walk with their friends or a bike ride or whatever the case may be? Because um, I'm just kind of, I'm noticing for those superstar kids who are like super outgoing and like they got social, so their social stuff down, they they're probably fine. You know, if they're gaming, if they're gamers, they're doing all that socialization and fun times with their friends through gaming. But there's that group of kids who might not, um, you know, it's not an easy thing for them to do. So I was just kind of thinking about what are ways to get them engaged with their friends. Also, yeah, um, the movie night's a great idea. Um, actually, my husband started just doing that with um, his guy friends, um, which is hilarious because my husband tends to fall asleep during the movie. And then his friends text me like, dude, your husband asleep right now but your kids like just doing that because that is something they could do via the computer like one person plays the movie on their computer but then they can all talk about it and like laugh about it and that you know it's something you know simple um but could be really fun and a way for them to connect um so our next question on here and again parents you know you can raise your hand or put a question in the chat um, if you want me to read the question, if you want to ask your question yourself, you can just raise your hand. Um, so our next question was, I'm wondering from the counseling session about the Summer Bridge program courses, um, how those are used in student unit, um, units and where is it applied? So um, Nancy or Natalie, I don't know if you want to take that about the Summer Bridge of a student Summer Bridge. How do those, credit, how do those credits count? So they go under elective credits. Um, they do not count toward, I mean, they go, they do count towards their overall requirements for, um, towards their 220 credits that they need to graduate. And um, they, they are not necessarily at an A to G class. They do not necessarily align, fulfill a, a requirement for the college system. So meaning that if they needed, let's say, four years of math, well, they only need two years of math to graduate and three years for college. Um, it's not really going into any of those categories other than the, um, just the elective category. Yeah, but to graduate from high school, you need at least 80 electives, so it's not like it's a waste. Um, our other counselor that was coming just joined us, and so um, I'm going to let uh, Jennifer Cody Miller introduce herself. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm a little bit late. I had... Um, a child with an appointment that I had scheduled for nine o'clock already. So I'm a little, little tardy, but um, it's good to see all of you here and uh, look forward to answering any questions or anything that we can help out with. So. And then what part of the Alpha D are you? Oh, sorry. Um, I work with students last names A through DR. Okay. So I've changed and shifted over the years. I've always had my A's, B's, C's, and then it's kind of shifted a little bit after that. So. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, so we've got another question. My concern right now is I don't know how to encourage my kid to challenge himself. Actually, my son is doing very well at academic, but he isn't interested in taking an AP class in the 10th grade. I respect his decision, but I also feel a little bit nervous if he's not positive to push himself how to encourage a high school student. Um, let me start with this because I'm going to um, be very honest with you guys that my feeling about this has very much changed. Um, just even in the past year. Um, and, you know, I'm somebody that used to be an AP teacher. Like when I was teaching, I taught advanced placement courses. I was all for AP courses. I thought they were the greatest thing ever. Um, when I went into administration, I started seeing like the downside of them. And now just seeing my own child struggle with her workload and, you know, the negative effects it can have, I'm not, I'm not that big of a fan. Um, one thing I would say about taking an AP class and, you know, if parents, any of the parents here are returning parents, you've heard me say this in previous years, 
don't take an AP class unless you love that subject area. Like you, because you're going to spend a lot of time on that class. And so, especially in the 10th grade year, there's not a lot of options. If they're very advanced in math, um, there are maybe like some like calculus, you know, we do have, but that's a very advanced math student and that's not the majority of our students. That's like 5% of our students. So really your options are maybe there's, um, there's principles of computer science, which I guess 10th graders can take. And then there's AP world history. But if you're not into computer science or you're not into history, like th those are classes you're going to, because AP classes take a tremendous amount of time. Like I would assume that a kid is spending one to two hours per night on that class, like doing the reading, doing the homework, like whatever it is. And if they don't like that subject, that is one to two hours that's stressing them out and that is just torture. So it's not worth it. Um, unless they love that subject area and they're really going to enjoy that time. Um, you know, in terms of pushing your kid academically, you know, I think it's always a balance. You do want them to take the most rigorous coursework they can handle. Um, you know, like high school is supposed to be preparing, you know, kids for what they're doing after. So whether it's career or going on to college. And so I would say like that's really the first step and Jenny and um, Natalie, you guys can chime in and like the work that we do with helping um, kids with their four-year plans. But really what we try to do as a school is drive the student and figure out like where are they trying to end up when they're done with high school? And then that's helping guiding like what courses they should take. So do you guys wanna chime in on that? Um, yeah, I wanted to chime in on um, just in general, I think all students are being challenged right now with trying to adjust and adapt to this new way of school, new way of living. And I've had a lot of students where anxiety, there's a lot more anxiety, a lot of students with depression, they don't know how to handle everything. So I would not push your children right now. If they're not into an AP, that might change later on down the road. I would just, if they're doing well in school, then they're doing well. That's great. Um, they're adjusting well they're studying well, that is what should be focused on. Also, the UCs, they'll only take eight semesters max, which is four classes. So if they start AP classes their junior year, they're not behind, they're not, you know, they're exactly where they're supposed to be. They still can um, take AP courses later on down the line. Um, and, you know, AP world is a lot of work. It's overwhelming for especially, you know, sophomore year because it's their really full schedule with chemistry and, um, you know, the history and math, second level of math, second level of foreign language usually. So sophomore year itself is a lot. Um, and then you add on an AP class and a lot of students aren't used to the amount of work. So junior year, the graduation requirements kind of dwindle down and they can focus more and have more time to take an extra AP class. So there's also that. So it's, if it's not the end of the world, they're not, you know, I think a lot of students think that they're behind if they don't take an AP their sophomore year. Um, so there's, there's a lot of adjustment that can be done their junior and senior year. I just want to, um, I want to echo a little bit of what Ms. Davis said earlier um, with regard to, you know, let's not try to like not, not forcing, um, what is it saying? Like a round peg into a square hole. Like, you know, having kids take an AP course that they're not interested in. Um, and this has come up a lot at some of the, you know, admissions conferences that we go to and, and college admissions officers will say, there's no quote unquote perfect, you know, uh, course sequence or, or course that they're looking for when admitting students. What they're looking for is passion. Um, and that's, I, I think that sometimes it's difficult to translate to an application, but passion is like, okay, I'm, I'm passionate about Spanish. I take it ninth grade, 10th grade, and, I, and I'm passionate, I continue it, right? Um, so really that passion and that drive should kind of be those things that drive some of those course selections too. Um, and then, you know, like Ms. Rodriguez Garcia said, or, or I think Ms. Davis, you know, when we do these, these career assessments, it's to help students sort of gauge what their interests are. And then high school is that chance to, to test out those interests, right? To test things out, see, well, do I like this? Am I interested in this computer science class? Well, maybe not really. Then maybe that's not the direction I want to go. So um, I really love that sometimes students get that chance to explore things more freely in high school. 
and um, and I always try to encourage them to do so. And I would also add, um, again, just to reiterate the interest piece, like there's this obscene amount of students who are taking AP science classes, and I think they get caught up in the, um, my friends are all taking these AP science classes, so I have to, but they really do not have any interest in going a science route, meaning like let's say medical or engineering or something along those lines. So again, it's just kind of like, well, if that's not your interest, like if it's, you know that you don't really want to deal with science to that extreme level, you don't have to. So I think a lot of times our students feel the pressure from among themselves that they're seeing each other doing things. And so they kind of just, well, my friend's doing it, so I should do that because that student, my friend is amazing and they know what's going on and blah, blah, blah. So that also is kind of a, a little pitfall that our students fall into, I think. Yeah, and that's actually um, a topic that Ms. Gunter and I do every year with these parent um, meetings, and we'll do it, um, we'll probably do it this semester, but it'll be in a couple months, um, the topic of academic peer pressure and how to help your kid like deal with that, because that is a major thing where they see like, oh, my friends, they're all taking this AP class, so I should be taking that, and like, again, if they don't love that subject area, then don't push them. My, my, my daughter was like, oh, I should take AP bio. And I'm like, but you hate science. Why? Why are you going to, are you thinking that you're going to be a doctor? She's like, no, not at all. And I'm like, well, why? You're not like, why would we, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. And so I just like, no, you're not going to take that. But I think that with this, and I, you know, I feel like I'm somebody because I'm an educator and I've been doing this, you know, for over 20 years, I should know better. But as a parent, it's so easy to fall into the trap of like, oh, this would be good for my kid and pushing. Um, you know, my daughter, her sophomore year, she did take an AP class. Um, her high school didn't offer AP World, but they offered AP European History as this um, 10th grade history class. I used to teach AP European History. I loved teaching AP European History. It was my most favorite thing to teach. I just I love that class. I love the topic. I love everything about it. And because it was a passion of mine, I just like assumed it would be a passion of my daughter's that she would be super into it. It would be like, I just had these dreams of like, it'd be so fun. Like she and I could discuss things and like, you know, it would be really great. It was not a great experience. It was a horrible experience. Um, because, well, she had a horrible teacher and like, it was a whole big mess. And there was like that story, but like it, it really, it caused her a lot of stress. It like really, we ended up having to get her a schedule change in the middle of the year. I mean, it just, it was bad. So I think that as parents, we tend to, and it's so easy to do like, I love this. So my kid's going to love it. And you want to share that with your kid. Um, and sometimes it just doesn't work out that way. And so be cautious of that. Um, and really, I think it's, and that's why I'm so glad that we do those interest surveys with the kids, you know, on Naviance where they get to take that. Um, and you as a parent can see those results and see, um, you know, how your kids scored and stuff and like what their interests are. And um, that's a really great thing because your kid may have an interest that you just may take you by surprise um, and be in the direction that, you know, I, you know, my daughter's now talking about, like, she wants to, like, go into the fitness industry and, like, that sort of thing. Well, that, I mean, I like to work out from time to time, but, like, that's not a passion of mine, but it very much is a passion of hers. And so they develop their own interests and passions, and it's really cool. Um, so there was a question, and um, counselors, if you guys want to address this, for college admission, GPA 9 through 12 and GPA 10 through 12 grades are considered differently. Can we explain? And then summer school, if a kid takes summer school between the 9th and 10th grade year, is that counted towards the GPA for the 10th grade? Where does that summer school in between, like, where does that count? Um, so the courses taken um, in the summer of like so between ninth and 10th grade courses taken during that time are often included in that calculation the 10th through 12th G GPA calculation okay so again courses taken summertime between 9th and 10th are factored into that 10th through 12th GPA calculation um, in terms of the GPA calculation you have different schools that might do different things so for example our private colleges and universities might be looking at a student's cumulative GPA Cumulative means GPA all throughout high school, all, all grades, everything, the whole kit and caboodle, okay? So that would just be everything in there. 
Um, our UCs and CSUs are looking at the GPA from 10th to 12th grade in A to G courses. So it's not to say like ninth grade doesn't matter because it certainly does, but in terms of the GPA that they're gonna to use to, you know, to determine admissibility, they're gonna do that looking at the A to G courses from 10th to 12th grade. And so like, for example, in 10th grade students take PE, that's not being calculated into the A to G GPA, but courses that are college proper or A to G courses from 10th to 12th grade are. Um, I'm trying to think of something else. Yeah, just like to add something. Yeah, yeah, let me add. Um, so a lot of students get confused because the GPA for the UCs and CSUs is just focused on 10th through 12th and they think, oh, freshman year. But there's also the A through G requirements, as Ms. Miller Cody mentioned. So the A through G requirements, it requires four years of English. So if they get a D in their English freshman year, it still it doesn't count for A through G. So it's considered unfulfilled, even though it's not counting towards the GPA. So it's two different requirements um, that are separate. Um, so freshman year does count subject wise for the A through G requirements, but the GPA starts um, summer after their freshman year. Um, so next question on here, the dilemma is that they explore and take different electives to see what they like, but they don't do well in the subject. Well, that if that will affect their GPA, which will directly affect their college admission. Um, so what I would say with that is, um, I guess I, I mean, I guess my question, I, I have a question back to the parent on like, well, what are you considering a bad grade? You know, like, and okay, they might get, not get an A. Um, and I feel like, actually, I feel, um, this especially like one thing, you know, kids tend to, I see a lot of kids that have really good GPAs, their freshman and sophomore years that maybe they got straight A's and they get this like idea that, oh, I'm gonna be a valedictorian and blah, blah, blah. Um, I actually think the best thing for a student is to get um, a B in their first semester, their freshman year, to just take that pressure off. Like they're not gonna be valedictorian and boom, but you could still have a really good GPA. Um, so I just, I don't ever wanna see students striving to be a valedictorian. Um, that just causes so much unnecessary stress and it's just not, I just don't think it's that important. Um, and um, I, so, I, I don't, I, colleges, you know, and you guys chime in, colleges want to see a well-rounded student. They want to see a student who's tried different courses and, you know, um, when you look on a transcript, it's sometimes easy to tell, like, you know, if a kid's just like driving and taking courses for like, you know, GPA. Um, and so, I don't know if you guys want to chime in on that, you know, what colleges look for. Yeah, yeah I wanted to mention that, um, the GPA doesn't, I mean, it's one of the 14 factors that the UCs and CSUs look at. So it's not just GPA. And if they did do, you know, bomb the class, let's say they got a, a D and an F or even, you know, a low C and they're an A student, um, that's going to stick out to them. And so they do have um, areas in the application to explain, hey, you know, I was trying this different area is really difficult for these reasons and that is why I had a C where clearly I'm not a C student I had all straight A's so it's nothing to worry about if anything I think it's good to venture out and, and you know take a look at those um, different interests and and it won't be considered a backlash or something bad as long as a student has learned from it grown from it and can move on that's what the colleges are looking for a well-rounded student that can handle a challenge and overcome something, even if it is a, a class that, you know, they thought they were gonna do well, um, something happened, they don't like it for whatever reason. So I wouldn't really say that it would be a bad thing to get a lower grade in trying to explore. You know, that's what the colleges wanna hear about. Um, so there's always something that can be added in the college application. And there's a lot more um, areas to be looked at um, other than GPA when looking, um, when the college admissions are looking at the application. Uh, and I think one more thing to add just about that exploration piece. Um, I mean, I, I understand your point 
the parents point to, you know, if the student does poorly in the course, you know, they can get a bad grade. But I think really high school should be that time to explore, to explore their options rather than, um, you know, exploring their options in college and, and paying a lot of money to do that too, because that's, you know, that can get, that can be kind of costly. Um, you know, I think that there's such limitations sometimes that when they do have a chance to take some courses that are open to them and, and that, that might match their interests and just to get a chance to see if they like it or don't like it, it's, it's a good chance to do that, you know, especially in the safe environment of high school, um, you know, versus down the road when you start taking courses at a, at a college and then deciding, well, you know, I really don't like these courses. I don't want to major in this anymore and then changing majors, you know, two years in. So, um, which that, that happens too. And that's, that's fine as well. So, but yeah, I think there's not, um, I think it's really a good, a good chance, a good opportunity in high school to try those different things. I kind of wanted to add a couple more things. Um, I, I was just thinking about a conversation I had yesterday with my daughter. She's only 13, but um, yeah. and it was like the compet like they put this competition on themselves of like, I have to be the best versus I have to do my best. And so that's kind of what I've been working with with her lately is like, what is doing the best for you mean? Because it shouldn't matter what so and so is doing because you're not you're not doing what so and so is doing. You're not so and so. So you what is doing the best like look like for you? What does that mean in 13, 14, 15, 15 16, 25, whatever? What does that mean? Like, you know, are you are you putting your best foot forward? Are you prepared? Are you being responsible? Are you um doing your assignments, like all of these things, if you're able to just keep up with yourself, <laughs> um, that's going to pan out in the end. Because what we're seeing is these, again, I'm back to this whole thing of like students just um, pushing themselves to the point of no return where they are getting sick and they have these issues of anxiety. And, um, and I think it's just, it's hard for them to understand that what does it mean to just do the best for me? What does that look like? Am I going to my tutorials? Am I asking for help? And you know what I mean? Like all of these elements are going to go way further in their life than let's say two AP classes. You know what I mean? Just building their um, character a little bit differently. The second part of my brain is like, man, I feel for our students and families because there is that mixed messaging that happens with the university system. And I think that's why um, it's important to acknowledge that and just say, hey, yeah, I laughed. I saw a TED talk from Stanford where they're like, we want them to find their passion and we want them to have all these great things. And that's true. But when you're accepting kids at a 5.0, then you're not really helping our cause is trying to develop well-adjusted citizens. Like it's really not happening in that capacity. So again, I guess I bring it back to, I just make sure that when your, your child is picking their classes and, and um, that they're actually picking things that interest them. And um, I have many email exchanges with well-intended parents that want to have their students take challenging classes. And, you know, I can pull up any transcript without looking at a student and see that they have straight A's, but I don't really know how that science class, math class, whatever is going to impact them personally. And I think that's why when course selection time is happening, um, they're meeting with their counselors and that was a really great time to have conversations with students again about their surveys and their interests. And again, just being the best of them versus the best version of somebody else. So that's kind of where I'm at. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it is, you know, hard. Uh, and a lot of these choices that we're talking about um, where, you know, they get to choose that isn't actually um, the reality, you know, um, in their freshman and sophomore years, um, their freshman and sophomore years, those, especially the sophomore year, there's the least amount of choice um, because that's, um, Natalie had mentioned, you know, that's where you're getting a lot of your graduation requirements out of, out of the way. You know, there's the PE, um, we bring in the world history, you're doing all the sciences. So there's, there's a lot of classes that they have to take. It's really when they get into their junior and senior year um, that they get to have a lot of choices. But what's nice now, and you know, I'm glad we're having this conversation um, in the freshman and sophomore years, this is the time to have the conversations about well, what classes do you think you want to take in the future that are going to be interesting? You know, do you want to, um, uh, you know, do you want to take AP sciences? Do you want to, or, you know, still, I mean, we actually have like a lot of variety um, 
where they don't necessarily have to take an AP class. Um, you know, they can take four years of science and never take an AP class um, because we offer physiology and we offer forensic science. Um, and so that's kind of nice because there are, you know, sciences out there. Um, and, um, you know, even with the math, you know, one, if they're, depending on where they start with math, you know, a lot of times they have to go the AP because those are the higher level maths. Um, but, you know, there is like classes like MRWC now and there's like other options. Um, I personally wish our district offered statistics that was not AP. Um, you know, that's going to be like my <laughs> thing that we should as a district do. Um, but there are a lot of, um, especially in like, like in the social sciences, there's ethnic studies, there's psychology, um, there's sociology, there's like a lot of courses that we offer. There's the music courses, there's um, the construction courses, the business courses. We offer a lot of courses that can really broaden, um, you know, what the students know about and, you know, their interests um, outside of, you know, their typical um, pathway. I do want to pitch though, if you're talking about like when you're having these conversations with your kids, one thing that, you know, and Ms. Prayer and I have talked about this and it's something that, you know, bugs us. Um, one thing that tends to, kids tend to stop at their second year of a world language is they meet the minimum requirement. If you were thinking about like, you know, that rigorous coursework and you want your kids to be competitive for college, they really need to take that third year of a world language. I just, like right now when you're planning that plan that like we want to take the third year like if you guys as parents are thinking like this is you know they want to be competitive for college i would say that's actually the biggest thing a lot of like we have a lot of parents that want to do the math and science and they tend to neglect the world language i don't know jenny i sorry that you took your mute yeah. off oh so. no i i totally agree i i absolutely agree I, it always it's it's always shocking to me when we're doing the scheduling um you know when we're working with our 10th graders who are going to be 11th graders and we're going over their scheduling and classes that they're choosing. And it, it, it's surprising to me how many times students are not choosing to take a third year of language. And I'll always look at them and say, well, are you planning to apply to a UC? And they'll say, well, yeah, well, you know, they recommend that you have three years of a language. You do know that. Right. And so, um, and I usually tell students if a school's recommending something, um, you have to anticipate that other candidates, other students are doing that same thing. So that's- They're not recommending it just for fun. Like yeah, that's actually yeah, what they yeah, want. Exactly, exactly. Code, you must take this. <laughs> yeah, okay, so um, let's talk, so we get into the question, isn't GPA the first thing you see or most colleges look at though? If a student wants to get into a major high demand, I'm assuming college, but the GPA is below what the colleges want to see, isn't the application going to be put aside and will really be considered? Um, can we, you know, I know, you guys as counselors go to these conferences. Um, this is kind of an interesting time, I think, about college applications because, um, you know, if you guys watch the national news, you know, the UCs, like things like this, SAT and the ACT are taking a back seat. Um, and that importance, you know, definitely seems like it's going to be lowered. So, like, what, you know, is really important? What are colleges really looking for? So, um, you know, I think the first thing that they usually look at from hearing it from multiple um, representatives of the different UCs is they look at the, the high school where they're coming from and, and take everything into context from just the high school. They don't compare, you know, this student to a San Diego student. Um, they just compare within the school what is available at that school. Um, and they actually look at everything first. It depends on the reader. They're not just going to look at the GPA and say, oh, no, nope, too low. Next. They really do take a look at the student as a whole. They're going to, for UCs, they're going to read the personal insight questions. They're going to see if there's additional comments. They're going to look at the grades. They're going to look at course selection. So I would say no, that they they don't just look at the GPA and automatically dismiss the application. Um, I was at a... Um, at a conference with the, just the UCLA representative. And he said, you know, for, for the, the engineering majors and nursing majors, yes, they do have a GPA that they have to have. Um, 
but it's not, you know, the end all if they don't meet that exact requirement. They do look at other circumstances if there are other circumstances and they have a second reader. So if one reader is like, oh, I don't know, I'm on the fence about this student, their GPA is not there, but they've done this extraordinary work in the community and they've challenged themselves in other ways, they'll give it to a second reader who's in the engineering department and, you know, say, hey, take a look. So they do kind of pass around the application if they're kind of stuck on something, they don't just, you know, toss it aside. They really do take a look at this, the student as a whole. I, I echo that. I also would say that I don't think there's any way to dance around the fact that they do still put a lot of emphasis on the GPA. Um, but they are looking at these other factors. If a st and also, I guess if a student does have at least the minimum admission GPA, their application is going to get the same review that any other application even with a 4.0 GPA that's going to get the same they have they're going to review all applications they're not just going to say oh that's below and just put it aside they they assure us anyway I mean we have to take them for what they say that they are looking at every application the same way so and um to go back to your um concern Jenny about the the SAT and the ACT not being considered as part of the application, they're still looking for core selection of students being challenged. So the fact that they take APs are still being looked at. It's not just, oh, well, they, they're not going to take, we're not going to take um, the subject test, so we can just toss out AP. They're still looking to see if they're challenging, challenging themselves in their core selection and also outside of school. What are they doing outside? Are they working? Are they taking care of siblings? Are they you know, um, involved in sports and clubs. So everything else is literally the same. It's just the testing SAT that is being taken out um, for the UCs. We haven't, um, the CSU conferences are coming up in the next couple of weeks. So we'll hear more from them, but from the UC system, that's what they're saying right now that, you know, it hasn't really changed other than the fact that, you know, um, th that they're not using the SAT scores. And, and the reason for that is they say, you know, if a student's a 4.0, naturally they're going to score high anyway. Um, so their course selection, you know, kind of has an impact on that side of their assessment. Just to clarify, though, is that for current seniors, juniors, or? Um, current seniors. Um, and there's a lawsuit right now um, with the UC system. So I'm sure that's been on the news and that's all that the UCs are talking about is that they can't comment right now, but it's looking like it's not coming back, the, the SAT requirement. That's what it's looking like right now, but no one's saying anything official. Yeah, yeah. And some of the UCs have just flat out said that like, like UC Santa Cruz and UC Berkeley, and I think there's another one I can't remember, um, that they're just not accepting it. So the, the UCs themselves aren't all on the same page, but there is a lawsuit. So mm -hmm. yeah, um, I would I would say about GPA and thinking about this is um, it's not just the GPA; it's the GPA and the coursework that was taken. So you could have two people that with the exact same GPA, but one student took more rigorous coursework and the other one didn't, and so it's the student with the more rigorous coursework is going to win out. You know, um, if you chose not to take that, like we were talking about that third year of the world language, because you were afraid you're going to hit, it was going to hurt your GPA. Well, actually not taking that third year is going to hurt you more. So again, it's a balance. Yes, the GPA is important. Um, and, you know, Ms. Cody mentioned like the minimum GPA, like, you know, colleges do have a minimum GPA to apply. Um, and so looking, you know, after you meet that threshold of minimum GPA and no college's minimum GPA is a 4.0. I mean, like that's, they don't do that. So, um, you know, once you meet, like that's when they're going to look at everything else, you know, did they participate in clubs, you know, like where they were an active participant and not just like, you know, one thing that t students tend to do is they tend to put a lot of stuff on their, um, like, resume, you know, like they were this, this, and this, but like, did they actually actively participate? Um, sports is really important. Like, you know, being an athlete, because that um, is something that shows colleges that yes, you were able to balance the commitment of like being um, an athlete and the time demands um, with your coursework. And that actually where we started this conversation today with about time management 
that's something that really colleges want to see is they want to see that a student was able to balance um, the commitments that they have, you know, did they have a job, you know, that sort of thing. Did they volunteer? Um, what were they doing? You know, that is all going to weigh. Um, and um, that's, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so we've got a question in the a g requirements. We have number of years of a subject requirement. Does that mean the students have to take that number of years in that subject, even if the students in advanced level and pass the requirement level? I think I know where they're going with this. So let me give an example and see if this is kind of what, what they're inquiring about. So for example, <clears throat> colleges, <clears throat> excuse me, colleges require students to have three years of math. And what that really means is they expect them to be at least a level three math course, which would be math three, right? Because that's what's gonna meet the A to G requirements. So, I mean, technically a ninth grade student could come in, take math three, get A's, and they would have met the A to G requirement, okay? Um, but they still have to have two years of math in, in high school for our graduation requirement. So they don't necessarily have to take those number of years, you know, um, but like if they have to ha at least get to that particular level. Does that make sense? And does that kind of clear up that question? Nancy looking at me confused. Yeah, I mean, I think that, yes, okay, she said yes. And so I think, you know, I can give an example of that too. Um, you know, my daughter, she got through Spanish three, but she had taken Spanish one in middle school. So she, when she started in high school, she was in Spanish two. Um, and so then she took Spanish three. So in high school, she only has two years of Spanish on her transcript, but she got through that third level. So yes, it is the level, um, you know, the example of like the math, you know, yes, you can start in math three and like technically meet the A through G, but then you actually haven't met the graduation requirements because graduation requirements is two years. So sometimes there's a kind of a, you know, and that's why we have the counselors to answer all those questions because, you know, every student, you know, there are some general rules and like guidelines that we put out, but every student is unique um, and has like, that's why we have the students create their own unique four-year plan. Um, so, um, I think can I answer. back up and clarify something yeah. about the GPA question really quick? So when we're when we're talking about the the ten to twelve A to G GPA, um, we just always kind of talk about it in terms like you know A to G GPA 10, 10 through twelfth grade. That's really actually a weighted GPA. And so that one one thing to know is that when you look, if you calculate our GPA from tenth to twelfth grade, um, on our transcripts, our GPAs are not weighted. Okay, so there's an extra step that's involved to weight the GPA to find out kind of what that 10th to 12th A to G GPA is. So like when colleges and universities are talking about that, what they're looking for in that, that A to G GPA, it is a weighted, it's a weighted one. So I just thought that might be a good place to kind of clarify that because we, we talk about it rather loosely and not, um, you know, sometimes I'll have students say, well, how did that student get a 4.1 in their A to G GPA? Well, because it's a weighted GPA. Yeah, and I think that's important that on our transcript and as a district, um, that's just district policy that we don't weight our GPAs. But that doesn't mean that that's what you give to the colleges. Basically, colleges will convert it. And then if you guys wanted just to see what it would be, um, you can Google weighted GPA calculators and stuff comes out and you can figure out what the weight, it's really easy to figure out. I don't know if we have any more questions. Um, I don't know if you guys want to really touch on um, the four-year plan a little bit more and like what, how we're going to do that this year with distance learning and like meeting with the kids and um, that sort of thing. We're working on that plan. We're working on that, yeah. Um, I think, <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to put you in front. Well, um, <laughs> well, in, our, in our presentation, we put the time frame that we would be working on it probably like October, November, I think. Um, to start to kind of work on that four-year plan piece with our with our ninth graders, um, tenth graders already you know set theirs up. So it's, for them, it's just a matter of kind of altering it if they need to make any changes. But ninth grade, um, I think we're kind of looking at October, November. I don't know, Nancy. You might want to add. Maybe Nancy's good. Uh, yeah, we're just trying to figure out. It, it would be October because we're September's already halfway done. <laughs> so. <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, October for sure. And I think our challenge right now is just, we, we go back and forth on like what format we like to use better. So right now we're just kind of debating what's going to be the easiest thing for our students. So um, that's really where we're at. And um, the idea is that the students will develop their four year plan and then they revisit through the next four years to make adjustments. And from there they build their course, their, their schedule requests um, throughout their high school time. And in that um, the, te the counselors will have one-to-one -one meetings in the winter, like January-ish, January. Well, we usually do it um, by the end of February, we're done. So they meet with the students one by one to um, select classes, to have the conversations with them a little bit more closely. They're fast conversations, but um, <laughs> so that way the students are picking the right classes. And um, so this year obviously is going to be a little bit more challenging with distance learning. So um, as far as how that's going to happen, but, you know, definitely still keeping to our same commitment to our students and getting those um, important meetings with our counselors done. Mm -hmm. um, we have one question pop up. This is more about the logistics of the weighted GPA. So if a college requires a weighted GPA, the school won't provide it. Um, I think the college actually weights it, doesn't they? Do. They do. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And they have, when they're applying, there's a, um, a GPA calculator directly from the UC that they can use and just kind of plug in their, their grades. Yeah. 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 Um, do we have honor classes in most subject areas? No, we do not. <laughs> um, and A and honor. So um, we honestly don't have honors classes in Eastside. Um, even um, the closest would be English 1A or English 2A, but those aren't considered honors courses. They're considered accelerated courses because the subject work is the same. Um, they just go a little bit faster. Um, so the only classes that are gonna count in a weighted GPA would be AP classes. And that's why um, I think it was Natalie had mentioned, you know, the colleges look at the school um, and so one thing that we have to do as a school that we provide colleges is um, we, it's called the school report, I can't remember what actually it's called, where basically we say, like, these are the AP classes that we offer. This is how we calculate the GPA. Do we rank the students? That sort of thing. And so colleges see that, like, we have to provide that mm -hmm. and, like, put that out. And then colleges see that and they know, okay, Piedmont Hills, this is how they calculate GPA. This is what classes were offered. So they aren't going to be punished because we don't, as a school district, offer honors courses, whereas, you know, a neighboring school district might um, because they're not compared to that. Nancy, you have something to add to that? I just want to add too, if a neighboring school district does offer an honors credit, it doesn't mean that the universities themselves are awarding that same honors credit. So that's also a little bit tricky. People are like, oh, they have all these honors classes. Well, they might, like you could put an honors designation on anything, but it's really at the end of the day, the university is going to determine if it is actually going to fit that honors criteria. And that's why they each calculate their own GPA. Yeah, I mean, that's honestly like really when you get down to like, why doesn't Eastside um, weight the GPA? There's a lot of downsides to as a district weighting GPA causes a lot of stress um, amongst the students. It causes a lot of competition amongst the students. Um, there's, there's definitely some downfalls. But then the practicality is the colleges are going to reweight based on like what they're going to look at anyway. And co colleges are all different. So, you know, the colleges will weight it. You know, and so what we provide as a school um, is we provide um, the transcript. And that's what they look at. Is our school system a ranking system? Yes, we do rank. And you can see the rank. Um, if, if you ever see the kids transcript that um, I don't think it's on the report card, but the rank is on the transcript. I think we is it still showing up on not there? anymore. Not anymore. Oh, it's not. Yeah. 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 So if they want to know the rank, they can contact the, their counselor. Um, I do have to um, get going. I have a, um, a conference, speaking of conferences, to get caught up um, at 10, so I'm going to have to excuse myself. Um, well, yeah, we're done. <laughs> so okay. thank you. Um, and thanks. Uh, these are really good questions. Um, I, you know, thank you and thank you everybody that participated today. Um, and uh, next week, I'm trying to remember what we're going to talk about next week. <laughs>
next week. Ms. Gunter is going to be back, and I think we're going to talk about stress and anxiety. Um, so, um, but I'll put it in my email about what our subject is. I'm, I'm having a brain fart, um, but I'm pretty sure we decided we were going to talk about stress and anxiety, um, which are always fun topics as I think all of us are super stressed and anxious right now. Um, so thank you guys um, for all of your questions. If you have further questions, um, I'm going to actually recommend that you, you know about the topics that we talked about today. Um, email your um, child's academic counselor. If you don't know who that is, if you look on our website, we have um, the alpha breakdown um, so that you can figure out um, who is your child's counselor. And they are by far the experts. You know, Ms. Prayer and I, we know some stuff, um, but the academic counselors, they're the ones that go to the conferences and like, you know, stay up on like what the actual requirements are because requirements are always changing. And so they're the ones that are the experts. So. Thank you guys so much. Hopefully you found this helpful and um, have a wonderful day. I hope that you, um, you know, I hope we get some blue sky at some point and don't feel like we're all in the zombie apocalypse. But um, yeah, <laughs> it's interesting times that we're in. So thank you guys. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Hey, Nancy. Yeah. Can I steal a moment of your time le later? Okay. Do you want me to call you? Yeah, whatever you want. I have a few IEPs, so um, in the afternoon. Af afternoon? I have a few IEPs. Okay. okay. All right, I'll call you in a little bit here, okay? okay. Bye, everyone. It's good seeing everybody. Bye.